This is Positively Farming Media. I think there are two types of people, those that love okra and those that absolutely can't stand it. But I'm convinced that at least half of those that can't stand it just haven't ever had it cooked properly. If you've only ever had it in gumbo or you had it undercooked or oversized and it was just slimy, well, you've not really had okra. Welcome back, my gardening friends, to another episode of Just Grow Something. I'll be honest, I hadn't ever even tried okra the first time I grew it. We just had so many customers at the farmer's market asking for okra every year, I decided to give it a try. It wasn't until that next summer that I tasted it and was admittedly a little underwhelmed. Yeah, I hadn't had it cooked properly yet either. What was not underwhelming, though, was the experience of actually growing the okra. Those plants were amazing. They were huge. They were resilient to just about everything our Missouri summer threw at them. They had zero pest problems and produced the most beautiful flowers all season long as they just produced and produced until the first freeze finally hit. Saving the seeds for the following season was super easy, and I even used the dried pods to create Christmas ornaments that year. And as we recently discussed on a companion planting episode, okra can be used to help control white flies in the garden. I mean, come on, how many other vegetables in our gardens are that versatile? And don't think if you're not in the South, or at least on the edge of it like we are, that you can't grow okra. You can most certainly grow this Southern favorite in a cooler climate with a shorter season with just a few tricks. On today's episode, we'll go over the basics of growing okra, including preferred temperatures and conditions that are key to its success, and discuss ways to work around some of those preferences to get yourself a crop, even in a short or difficult climate. Let's dig in. Hey, I'm Karen, and I started gardening 18 years ago in a small corner of my suburban backyard. When we moved to a five-acre homestead, I expanded that garden to half an acre, and I found such joy and purpose in feeding my family and friends. This newfound love for digging in the dirt and providing for others prompted my husband and I to grow our small homestead into a 40-acre market farm. When I went back to school to get my degree in horticulture, I discovered there is so much power in food, and I want to share everything I've learned with as many people as possible. On this podcast, we explore crop information, soil health, pests and diseases, plant nutrition, our own nutrition, and so much more in the world of food and gardening. So grab your garden journal and a cup of coffee and get ready to just grow something. Okay, so a quick thank you to those who reached out and asked about my eye after the silly incident with the tomato plant. I'm fine, really. The itching and the burning was temporary, and I was right as rain by the next morning. What I am dealing with right now, though, is a gardening overuse injury. I swear it's the truth. I have developed gluteal tendinopathy from the incessant amount of squatting, bending, reaching, and lifting that I have been doing in the gardens. I think that, combined with using a different vehicle for my weekly deliveries, which sits much lower to the ground than my pickup truck, has caused an overuse injury that's normally seen in athletes that play soccer and also runners, which of course means I now have to take a short break from running because I can't take a break from the gardening. I'll have to modify the way that I'm doing the gardening, which was really interesting while I was trellising tomatoes this morning. And I need to add some strength training to my routine so I can be healed up in time to start marathon training for the fall. But I mean, come on, who gets tendonitis in their glutes from gardening? I do now, apparently. This whole aging thing is just for the birds. news is I won't have to worry about bending or squatting or reaching down into my okra crop. Okra grows nice and tall when it's healthy, and it really doesn't need much in the way of maintenance. It really has been, for me, a kind of seed it and forget it kind of a crop. It's even done well out competing all but the tallest and the strongest of weeds, which means I have to keep the Johnson grass out of it, but nothing else has seemed to give the okra crop a run for its money. So are you ready to grow okra? All right, as always, let's start with the basics. The Latin name for okra is Abelmoscus esculentus, and it's in the Malvaceae family, which is the mallows. Now, if you've ever seen the flowers of an okra plant, this should come as no surprise because they look very much like the other species of the family, like hollyhock and hibiscus. But that plant family also includes cotton and cacao. 
The true origin of okra is a little uncertain because there is no known truly wild specimens, only naturalized ones. The theory is that okra originated in very hot areas of Africa and Asia, was cultivated in the Middle East and India, and there have even been carved examples of okra found in Pharaoh's temples in Egypt. Now, it seems to have made its way from Egypt to Europe in the early 1200s and then was brought to South America by the slave trade in the mid 1600s hundreds, and then made it to North America in the early 1700s, with record of it being grown as far north as Philadelphia by 1748. Now, it's important to note here that okra used in West Africa is a different variety than what we typically see in the other areas of the world, which is part of the debate about where A. esculentus originated, because the West African okra is Abelmoscus calii, and it is considered a traditional food there. Which brings us into a great time to discuss the cultural significance and ethnobotanical uses for okra. Remember, ethnobotany is the study of a region's plants and their practical uses through the traditional knowledge of a local culture and its people. These uses are cited as a historical and anthropological resource. Never ingest the parts of any plant without being absolutely positive of its effects upon the human body. Okra is a multi-purpose crop. It is very much valued for those tender little pods. But in West Africa, leaves, buds, and flowers of the okra are also consumed. The dried seeds provide oil, protein, vegetable curd, and it serves as a coffee substitute. Dried okra seeds contain 18 to 20 percent oil and 20 to 23 percent crude protein, which means it's a very important food staple. The foliage can be used for biomass, and the dried stems serve as a source of paper pulp or fuel. Quite literally, the entire plant is used in its native regions. Now, as far as nutrition is concerned, according to the USDA National Nutrient Database, one cup of raw okra at 100 grams contains 33 calories, 1.9 grams of protein, which is a lot for a small amount of a vegetable, um, 0.2 grams of fat, 7.5 grams of carbohydrates, just over three grams of fiber, and about a gram and a half of sugar. But okra also contains a good amount of vitamin K, potassium, vitamin C, magnesium, and calcium, along with some vitamin B6, folate, vitamin A, and other trace minerals. It is a very healthy food for us. Okra also contains a variety of antioxidant compounds, antimicrobials, and anti-inflammatories. Now, if you're an okra lover, you should be aware that eating too much okra can actually cause some gastrointestinal problems if you're not used to it and if you have some existing issues. Okra is also high in oxalates, and just like with spinach, folks who are prone to kidney stones may want to avoid consuming high oxalate foods in large quantities. And okra's high vitamin K content may affect those who use blood-thinning drugs like warfarin or coumadin because vitamin K helps the blood clot. But because okra seeds can also provide oil and protein, in regions where food is often scarce, the seeds can offer a really good source of high-quality protein. This is also great news for vegan eaters who may struggle with getting enough plant-based protein. So how do we grow it? Okra requires hot weather full sun, and well-drained soil. It is very sensitive to cold temperatures. So even though you will see instructions to plant it after the last frost or even four weeks after the last frost, don't let that be your guide. You want your soil temperature at at least 75 degrees Fahrenheit and overnight lows staying above 60 degrees Fahrenheit. Most okra varieties need a minimum of 55 to 65 frost-free days with daytime temperatures consistent Consistently above 85 degrees Fahrenheit or 29 Celsius to kind of meet its full potential. And some heirloom varieties can take up to 75 days to produce. So here, we generally don't even think about putting our okra in until after our sweet potatoes have gone in the ground. And that's usually well after the first week in June. We just got the sweet potatoes planted over the past weekend, and we're in the second weekend of June. So now the okra seeds will go into the ground. If you're in zone 7 or further south in the northern hemisphere, that this shouldn't be any kind of a problem for you. It's the rest of us in zone 6 and further north that need to consider our varieties and our timing a little bit more. 
So unless you're in a short season area, direct sowing your okra is the best path. I'll talk about all the short season tricks here in a minute. Okra just doesn't love being transplanted. So it's easiest to sow them in place for the first few times that you grow it. The seeds should be planted about a half inch deep and about 10 to 18 inches apart or thinned to that distance apart for the best results. Now, to be honest, though, I just use my little earthway walk behind cedar at whatever spacing I can manage. I think it's usually like four to six inches apart. And I never come back and thin those seedlings. It really does end up as a thick stand of plants, but it doesn't appear to impact my yield at all. But if you have a smaller space, you may decide to adhere to that proper spacing just to make the most of what you've got. Now, if you are in an ideal climate for growing okra, they can get as tall as 10 feet tall. So be sure you keep this in mind when you're planning where these are going to be growing in your garden. Mine generally hit around the six or seven foot mark. And that's why I say there's not going to be any stooping or bending with this crop. I'm often actually ducking under the leaves, though, to get to the pods that I just can't see from above when they get that tall. It's a literal okra jungle, and I am searching for the pods. Now, there are dwarf varieties of okra, though. So if you need something more compact so that it doesn't like shade out the other plants being grown in your small area, you'll be able to find those. Obviously, with most crops, the more fertile the soil, the better. But in my experience, okra can scavenge nutrients pretty well, and it has grown in some not-so-great soils on my place. Amend with compost at the beginning of the season, as always, and if your soil is particularly void of nutrients, then use a continuous-release plant food of some type or side-dress it with a balanced fertilizer. You just don't want high nitrogen unless you're really depleted, because then you'll end up with lots of vegetation and very few flowers. Now, I've not used any of the Elm Dirt products on my okra because I've never needed to, but I can imagine the bloom juice would work well once the plants are established and blooming and fruiting. I've also noticed our okra tends to do just fine in a drought. I've never seen a substantial drop in yield when we've had long periods without rain, and I've never irrigated mine. So if you have a challenging area in your garden, this might be a good spot for okra. And then another cool thing about okra is it doesn't need as an acidic soil as most of our other garden plants. It does best in soil with a pH between 6.5 and 7.0, so pretty neutral. And it can do just fine in a pH as high as 7.6. Now, this is about the same as what we aim for in growing asparagus. So if you have an area near an amended asparagus bed, you can plant okra there and know that the soil pH will be conducive for both crops and, since okra determines as white flies, it can be a good companion crop for the asparagus. And that deterring property may just be a reason to grow okra in the garden or on the perimeter of the garden, even if you don't like to eat it. We always have a white fly problem in our tomatoes at this time of the year. And okra also gets along well with peppers, cucumbers, basil, eggplant, and melons. So you might just consider it a, a companion planting or a companion crop if you have a white fly issue. Now, There's really not much to do with okra once it sprouts, other than keeping the weeds down. It really is very hands-off. If you're trying to grow okra in a short season or other difficult area, here are some tricks to getting them to a harvest before your first frost. Choose fast maturing varieties. There are some okra plants that are bred to mature in as little as 50 days. Blondie, Alabama Red, and Jambalaya are a few that I know of. If you have enough frost-free days, but you live in an area where the summers can just be cooler overall, like some areas of the Pacific Northwest or mountainous regions like Colorado, you can always look for varieties that are specifically for cooler weather. These include Antiope 2, Jing Orange, and Blondie again here, and that's Blondie with a Y, B-L-O-N-D-Y. Another trick is to start your seeds indoors. Now, I know I said okra does best when it's not transplanted, but if you only have a short window of opportunity, you got to do what you got to do. Start them indoors, preferably in something like a peat pot, soil block, paper pot, or something else that won't require you taking the plant out of the container before putting it into the ground. If you can just pull open the bottom of the pot and drop the plant into the soil, pot and all, without disturbing the tap root, the plant will be better for it. And then to speed up the germination, you can also soak the seeds in water overnight to get them sprouting more quickly. You want to get your okra started indoors about a month before you plan to transplant them.
And yes, you can grow okra in containers. You'll want to go for the dwarf varieties that don't get as big because the shorter plants also tend to be more narrow, which are both traits that lend themselves better to container growing. And okra is self-pollinating. So you don't need a ton of plants in order to ensure cross-pollination, which means... If you're a short season gardener who is desperate for okra, you can go ahead and start some larger pots of okra indoors and simply move them outside once the temperatures are conducive. Then if an early frost threatens, you'll be able to move the containers indoors to protect your plants and finish out the growing season. I'm serious when I say you can grow almost anything in a container. Now, right after the break, we'll talk about what plagues okra, what pests and diseases are they prone to, and we'll talk about harvest and storage. And these last two may just be the key to converting people from okra loathers to okra lovers. I'll be right back. As we head into the summer heat, our garden plants may need a little help to get through. Now's the time I start using my bloom juice from Elm Dirt as a foliar spray in my garden for all my flowering and fruiting plants. Elm Dirt has a new code for friends of the podcast with a buy one, get one free offer. Just go to justgrowsomethingpodcast.com slash dirt and use code Wolf Creek, all caps, all one word at checkout and get your second item of equal or lesser value for free. Just grow something podcast.com slash dirt with code Wolf Creek. The link is in the show notes. So what pests want to eat our okra as much as we do? The most common ones are aphids, flea beetles, spider mites, and root knot nematodes. Now, in most of these, we can just spray the pests off the plants, no harm, no foul. With the nematodes, they are soil dwellers. So this is a case where marigolds are beneficial since they deter those particular pests. Of course, if you have a spider mite problem, the marigolds tend to draw those in, so they might be better suited to be further away from the okra plants in that case. Now, if you've had a root knot nematode problem before, crop rotation and solarizing your soil can help and adding chitin to your soil by using things like mealworm frass or mushroom compost is another way to battle them. Now, thankfully, okra is one crop that I've never had to deal with major damage from pests. The aphids I've seen don't ever seem to do enough damage to make a difference, and eventually the ladybugs swoop in and take care of that problem. The flea beetles can be a problem early on when the plants are still small, and I've dusted with first Saturday lime when needed there, but that's been about it. Oh, and if you have cutworms, use collars around the plants if you see their little heads being chopped off. It, it's not a pest specific to okra, but just about any plant in the garden is susceptible to them, and you likely already know if you have cutworms hanging around. And thankfully, there aren't a lot of diseases that plague okra. The two notable ones are verticillium wilt and fusarium wilt. These are both fungal diseases that will cause the plant to wilt and dry up and die suddenly during the peak of the season. Really, the only thing you can do is remove infected plants and dispose of them outside of the garden area to prevent the the spread of the disease to other plants, and then rotate your crop out of there for the next season so you don't get a fungal buildup in the soil. Now, under nice hot conditions, it can take just four days from the time you see the flowers on your okra to the time you need to pick the fruit. So unless you're aiming for extra large specimens for gumbo or for drying for crafts, the best size for an okra pod is just at about the two to four inch length. Trust me when I say you want to check the plants daily because just like with cucumbers and zucchini, you can blink and the pod will be oversized. I think this is sometimes where people decide they don't like okra. If it's harvested later, it can be bitter and tough. It develops more of the sap in the inside that's responsible for that slimy texture. And then combine that with incorrect cooking methods and you've got the perfect storm for just hating a vegetable. So pick them while they're young and tender. Use a knife or shears to cut the pods from the plant. Otherwise, you can damage the stalks. You really also want to wear long sleeves and maybe gloves when harvesting. Okra has these really prickly stems and they can really cause you to itch if you're in there for too long. 
I have some pull-on sleeves that I got from SA Company, the same place that I got my lovely sunflower garden hat. And they are really easy to just slip on when I go into the okra without causing me to feel overheated. Gardener's Defense is another brand of these arm sleeves. I can say they're very helpful in the garden for protecting my arms from weeds or okra stems or even when I'm working in the tomatoes. Now, once you've got them harvested, put your fresh cut okra in a paper bag in the refrigerator or wrap it loosely in a paper towel and put it in a perforated plastic bag. Do not wash it until you are ready to use it. And if it happens to be damp when you pick it, be sure to dry it just by patting it dry before storing it. It likes a humid environment, but you don't want them wet. It will very quickly grow funky. Like I said, it likes a humid environment, but it likes the temperatures to be between 45 and 50 degrees, which is warmer than most of us keep our fridge. So put it in the warmest place, which is usually your refrigerator door. They will last about a week in the fridge with no loss of quality. Now, how you cook it is entirely up to you. I will tell you, I have converted even the pickiest eaters to okra by coating it whole in olive oil and seasonings and then roasting it at a high temperature in the oven until it is super crispy and then serving it hot with a cool dipping sauce. The little stems act like a little handle to hold while you're dipping it. Just don't eat them after they've cooled, though. The texture is kind of weird at that point. And you really can't go wrong with a properly breaded and deep fried sliced okra. Yes, I love taking veggies that are really good for me and deep frying them. Don't judge me. Now I have one other tip. If you live somewhere really warm where your okra actually stops producing because it gets too hot and dry, or if your plants get so big you can't reach to harvest them, cut them down. Yes, cut them down. Prune them down so the plant is only about 6 to 12 inches tall above the soil line. This is called retuning, and it forces the plant to create new growing points. If your plants have stopped producing midsummer, this will give you a bumper fall crop. If the plants have gotten too tall for you to manage, they will start growing again and producing again in about a month at a much more manageable height. I hope this information encourages you all to give okra a try in the garden this season. Let me know if you give it a go. I always love to see pictures of what you all are doing in your gardens. Until next time, my gardening friends, keep on cultivating that dream garden, and we'll talk again soon. You just finished another episode of the Just Grow Something podcast. For more information about today's topic, go to JustGrowSomethingPodcast.com where you can find all the episodes, show notes, articles, courses, newsletter sign up, and more. I'd also love for you to head to Facebook and join our gardening community in the Just Grow Something Gardening Friends Facebook group. So if you have an area near an amended asparagus, uh, <clears throat> asparagus, asparagus, we always have a white five for blah, 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 slow down. Until next time, my gardening friends, keep learning and keep growing.